Hello, can anybody hear me? Yes, uh, great to uh, be here this evening. I uh, hope everyone is uh, keeping safe and well out there, uh, sitting at home uh, like most of you for the last uh, month or so, uh, going through my uh, Civil War collection and reading a lot of Civil War books. Uh, good evening. Um, I would like to welcome you to Caretakers uh, this evening, Saturday, April 18th, 2020. And this is brought to you by the Civil War Photo Collector Society directed by Doug York and Ron Coddington. Today, I am going to give you a tour of my Civil War collection. My name is Rob Grandchamp. I am a collector, and I have been interested in the Civil War for quite a while. If you hear uh, noise in the background, that is my 18-month-old uh, daughter, uh, Addison, who's uh, trying to join in. And I'm coming to you live tonight from the Green Mountains of Vermont. And while I may live in Vermont, my collection focuses on one specific regiment from my native state of Rhode Island. I am originally from Rhode Island. I went to Rhode Island College. I obtained a master's degree in American history from there. I'm a former National Park Ranger with service at Blackstone Valley, Harper's Ferry and Shenandoah. For the last 10 years, I have been uh, living and working here in Vermont uh, with the federal government as an analyst. And my collection focuses on the 7th Rhode Island. This is a regiment that I have uh, studied extensively, have uh, walked in their footpaths uh, from Virginia and Maryland to Tennessee, Kentucky, and Mississippi, I've followed the path of the 7th Rhode Island. And my journey to getting interested in this regiment really started years ago. Like uh, many, my family took the obligatory trip to Gettysburg when I was probably five or six. And I was interested in the Civil War. I remember looking out across the field, being interested. Uh, the movie Gettysburg came out when I was uh, eight years old and uh, was very interested in that even uh, in the early 90s. But my interest in the Civil War really didn't get to be what it is today until about 2001. And in 2001, I was uh, doing a school project, uh, find out who you are, where you came from. And my family has always lived in the part of Rhode Island that I come from. And doing some re research into the family and to uh, my genealogy, I found out that my great, great, great uncle, Alfred Sheldon Knight of Situate, Rhode Island, uh, served in the Civil War as a member of Company C of the 7th Rhode Island Infantry. And he died serving in the regiment. Uh, originally, the, uh, the official records, uh, as you might say, said that he died of pneumonia. Uh, unfortunately, as I've done research on him over the years, uh, discovered that he actually froze to death in a blizzard at Falmouth, Virginia on January 31st, 1863. And fortunately uh, for the family, uh, his remains were brought back to Rhode Island and buried on the family farm. A little bit about the 7th uh, Rhode Island. They were one of only three three-year infantry regiments uh, raised in Rhode Island. Uh, during the war, Rhode Island uh, raised 24,000 men in eight infantry regiments, three cavalry regiments, three heavy artillery, light artillery, and some others. I, I forgot to mention, I've actually... Uh, written 15 books about the Rhode Island Civil War experience, and I honestly cannot tell you how many articles I've published. It must be 50 or 60 uh, by now. So 
The uh, 7th Rhode Island is recruited uh, from all parts of Rhode Island in the summer of 1862, uh, primarily in July and early August. And unlike other Rhode Island regiments, the 7th has a very rural flavor to it. Uh, the vast majority of the men are farmers and mill workers from southern and western Rhode Island, and their average age is 21 years old. And they come together at Camp Bliss in Cranston, Rhode Island uh, during August of 1862. And the regiment is very fortunate in who Governor William Sprague appoints to command it. Uh, to command the 7th Rhode Island, he appoints Zenas Randall Bliss of Johnson, Rhode Island as the Colonel of the 7th. Bliss is a native Rhode Islander. He is also a West Pointer, class of 1854. He spent six years on the Texas frontier uh, performing garrison duty, fighting Comanche Indians. Uh, he was captured early on in the Civil War when federal forces uh, surrendered in Texas, spent about a year as a prisoner of war, returns to Rhode Island, uh, spends two months as the commander of the 10th Rhode Island, which was a militia regiment called up in uh, May of 1862 for a three-month uh, tour of service in the defense of Washington. And in August, uh, Bliss becomes the colonel of the 7th. And they, the men are blessed, truly, to have this man as their commander. He molds this assortment of Rhode Island farm boys and mill workers into arguably the finest fighting regiment sent by Rhode Island to the front during the war. And time and again, Bliss's training, Bliss's expertise will be used by his men as they really become an efficient regiment in the long years of war that they serve. So they leave Rhode Island on September 10th, 1862. They're assigned to the 1st Brigade, 2nd Division of the 9th Corps, uh, commanded by fellow Rhode Islander, uh, Major General Ambrose Burnside. They spend a few weeks uh, training in Maryland near Ant the Antietam Battlefield in Pleasant Valley. And in October, the 7th moves with the Army of the Potomac towards Fredericksburg. Uh, they are at Fredericksburg on December 13th of 62. They go in as part of the third wave to assault Mary's Heights. As other Union regiments uh, disintegrate under fire, the men of the 7th dress their ranks and keep on going forward. Uh, they come to a slight swale of ground about 75 yards from the sunken road uh, near where the 7-Eleven is uh, today in the city of Fredericksburg. And they perform amazingly well in their first test under fire. Uh, during the battle, uh, Colonel Bliss grabs a musket from a soldier who had been shot dead at his feet and joins his men on the firing line. For those actions in 1898, he will be awarded the Medal of Honor. The Battle of Fredericksburg is what makes the 7th Rhode Island what it is, but it came at a horrible cost. 570 officers and men went into the fighting, 197 were killed, wounded, or missing, 40% of the regiment that day. Uh, they spent a miserable winter at Falmouth, uh, Virginia, losing uh, severely to the elements. And in March of 63, together with the 9th Corps, they're transferred to Kentucky. In June, they are sent to Vicksburg, and they get to Vicksburg uh, just in time to see the tail end uh, not really engaged in any of the fighting in the trenches. They're sort of uh, in the rear performing guard duty. However, they do march with Sherman's relief force to Jackson, and they are heavily engaged at Jackson, Mississippi on July 13th. Mid-August, they return to Cincinnati. Miss the Mississippi campaign is, again, a horrible experience for these men. They suffer severely from yellow fever, malaria, dysentery, typhoid, uh, they get back to Cincinnati, they're a shell of themselves. There were fewer than 45 men able to bear arms. And rather than uh, join Burnside in his advance on Knoxville, uh, they spend the fall of 63 recovering in Lexington, Kentucky, and then guarding Burnside's supply line through the winter of 64. April of 64, together with the 9th Corps, they return back to Virginia, taking part in the Overland Campaign, they're at the Wilderness, heavily, heavily engaged, uh, both May 12th and 18th at Spotsylvania. They're at the North Anna River uh, at Cold Harbor uh, on June 1st. 
On June 3rd, they take part in the assault at Bethesda Church. Uh, by this point, they're down to about 150 men in Cold Harbor, pretty much does the regiment in. Uh, they get to Petersburg with fewer than 100 men. They take part in the charges on June 16th, 17th, and 18th. Uh, the 7th is a shell of itself. There's hardly even enough men to muster one full company. Um, company H of the 7th was my hometown company. At the end of the Overland campaign, the company was down to one man. So it goes to show you the heavy fighting that they took part in. They uh, take part in the siege of Petersburg, uh, performing uh, guard duty, uh, engineering duties. They're at the crater, helping cover the Union retreat. Uh, September, they advance on Hatcher's Run, the Weldon Railroad. They're at Poplar Spring Church on September 30th. After that, they're consolidated with the 4th Rhode Island. That brings the numbers uh, back up somewhat. And in the winter of 64, 65, they garrison uh, Fort Hell before Petersburg, take part in the Appomattox campaign, and go back to Rhode Island on June 9th of 65. Uh, 1,145 men will serve in the 7th Rhode Island. 243 uh, will die. It's a 21% mortality rate, uh, the highest of any Rhode Island uh, regiment during the war. So that's a little uh, bit about the 7th Rhode Island. And after I found out that I had an ancestor in this regiment, I wanted to know more about the men that he served with. Uh, Alfred Knight was just one little piece in the much larger picture of those 1,145 men that served in the 7th Rhode Island. And as I discovered the 7th Rhode Island uh, when I was in high school, and as soon as I was able to, I went out and bought this uh, doorstop. And this is the... Regimental History, the 7th Regiment, Rhode Island Volunteers in the Civil War, 1862-65, to 65, uh, by William Palmer Hopkins. And I read lots of regimental histories, uh, especially Army of the Potomac, 9th Corps. That's, that's really my focused uh, study area. Not just being biased against the 7th Rhode Island, this is probably one of the best of the post-war regimental histories. Uh, Hopkins, I'll get into later on, uh, it's basically his diary during the war together with other remembrances of other 7th Rhode Island soldiers. But what makes this book very important is the photographs. Hopkins put photographs of nearly 300 men from the 7th Rhode Island into this book. And those photographs are very, very important, of course, uh, studying the regiment, but they're mostly photographs of enlisted men, mostly photographs of corporals, sergeants, privates, etc. So it's really one of the best regimental histories. And that was the first piece that I ever bought uh, about the regiment. And getting interested in it, started going to battlefields, following uh, their path. Uh, I've been in the swamps of Mississippi on 100 degree August day, I followed their path on backcountry roads in central Kentucky. I've been everywhere they've been. I've even been to that 7-Eleven at Fredericksburg, which is now where uh, they fought. But I really didn't start uh, collecting photographs early on. Uh, being a uh, the stereotypical poor high school student, um, you know, I would uh, I would see things occasionally online. I'd, I'd Google 7th Rhode Island. You know, I'd see things pop up, but I really couldn't, uh, you know, afford things early on. But once I got into college, uh, started uh, working odd jobs, I had some extra funds, and that's when I started uh, collecting. Um, I knew that these, these items were out there, and I was quite happy to go out and find them. And my collection really took off in 2005 when I made my first purchase. And I was very fortunate to grow up in Rhode Island. Uh, I had a very good mentor that helped me early on. Uh, for those of you who know him, Mark Dunkelman is the absolute gold star standard when it comes to studying regimental histories. 
Uh, Mark is a very old and very dear friend of mine. Uh, he's the president of the Rhode Island Civil War Roundtable, and he has devoted his life to the study of the 154th New York Infantry that his great-great-grandfather served in during the Civil War. And Mark uh, told, you know, where, where I should go to find, you know, letters, find the things that I needed to eventually uh, contribute to my writing. And I should also add that Rhode Island is an absolute fantastic place to do research. 1,200 square miles, 39 cities and towns. Rhode Island really has it all at your fingertips. And going to college in Providence, I had the Rhode Island Historical Society, the Rhode Island State Archives, Brown University, Providence College, Rhode Island College, uh, the Providence Public Library with a fantastic Civil War collection uh, right there. So really everything was right there, either in Providence or in outlying communities, local historical societies. And I've been literally to every archive, library, museum in Rhode Island. I visited the grave of every Civil War soldier buried in that state. And that has all helped me to build a picture of the Seventh Rhode Island, which I've put into my writings. So Mark was really the spark that helped me in my early days of collecting, where to go find things, what dealers to work with, but also working at the grassroots level, uh, befriending several Rhode Island antiques dealers who were very helpful. Uh, some of them were uh, very uh, pleasant that a young man at the time was uh, happy to uh, begin collecting the Civil War. Uh, some of them you know, sold me items at cost, below cost, and all of that really helped to build my collection. And so I have uh, pulled uh, some items today. I actually spent about two hours this morning going through the collection. It's, it's fairly large. And uh, pulling out some items that are representative, some uh, interesting stories uh, to go with. So I will uh, start talking about the collection now. Uh, I am putting on uh, rubber gloves as uh, I will be handling uh, these as a former uh, NPS ranger working with collections, uh, working at some museums in Rhode Island, uh, learning uh, gloves are a pretty important thing. So hence the, uh, the gloves. So when I, uh, back, uh, like I said, in uh, 2005, I, uh, I got on eBay for the first time and, you know, didn't really know what I was doing, but I typed in 7th Rhode Island. And this guy popped up. And this is Lieutenant George Inman. And uh, Inman was originally from Burrillville, Rhode Island. He was a school teacher before the war. He uh, recruited a, a company for the 7th, uh, became uh, first lieutenant of uh, Company H, and he was at Fredericksburg, but in a very different capacity. He commanded the 9th Corps wagon train. And uh, I guess he saw some pretty horrible things in that battle because he resigned three weeks after Fredericksburg and went home. And I saw this CDV pop up on eBay and post, post uh, military service wearing uh, civilian clothes. And uh, written on the back, uh, Dunshi, artist, Providence, but you can see uh, in period pencil, uh, ex-Lieutenant uh, G. Inman. I saw that uh, pop up, and uh, it was only a $10 bid. Now, mind you, this is 2005. Uh, when I started this collection, you could still find some of this stuff for relatively uh, reasonable uh, prices. But I nervously waited four and a half days for the auction to close. I had my bid on. And uh, I still remember getting this at my, uh, my place where I was living at the time and just being amazed that I was actually holding an original photograph of a 7th Rhode Island soldier. And I should add that for me, as both a historian and a collector, it, it doesn't matter to me if it's a, uh, a civilian image, if it's a pre-war image, a wartime image, even a post-war image of some of these men who lived into their 80s and 90s. It's the fact that they are one of those 1,145 men who served in the 7th Rhode Island. And so Lieutenant George Inman came to my house in October of 2005, and he was my, uh, my very first purchase. 
and uh, still, uh, still very uh, proud uh, of this photograph. Um, what I do, uh, how I how I keep my collection, I keep each photograph in an uh, archival uh, sleeve. That goes into acid-free folder, acid-free box, very secure location, and uh, that's how I preserve them. But what I also do is I keep index cards for each man. And this is helpful for me so I can quickly, uh, when I pull out some of these images, I can quickly reference uh, who they are, uh, their service, uh, dates of service, profession, um, what companies they were in. Um, also, if known, uh, date of death. For example, uh, after the war, Lieutenant Inman moved out to Kansas, uh, continued as a, a grocery store uh, merchant. He died April 1st of 1920, and he's buried at Fort Leavenworth uh, National Cemetery. Uh, so I do keep uh, index cards with all the information that I can find uh, on each uh, soldier. So Inman was the, uh, was the first purchase uh, but one of many. And I should add that I've, I've gotten away from eBay over the years. It, you know, eBay, eBay was very good in the early days of collecting. I'd say until about 2012, 2013. And, you know, eBay is very good because it brings images that you might not otherwise see. If you go to, say, an auction in Rhode Island, if you go to uh, some of these other dealers that are just local, uh, I believe the Inman uh, image came out of uh, Ohio or Indiana, uh, a boutique dealer out there. But it drives the prices up. And, you know, it's very easy to bid, bid, bid. And, again, you know, this these early images, you know, relatively inexpensive at the time. If that was on eBay today, uh, being a Rhode Island image, Rhode Island is a very collectible state. Uh, again, a very small state at the time. Rhode Island sent about 24,000 men uh, to the war. That image would probably go for seventy-five to one hundred dollars. So, um, you know, eBay is, um, you know, uh, something that was very good in the early days of uh, collecting, but uh, not so much now. So, uh, like I said, I'll bring out uh, some representative images and the stories that come with them. But, like I said at the beginning, you know, the man who really was the inspiration for this collection was Alfred Sheldon Knight, and I was fortunate early on in my research that I found a relative of mine in situate Rhode Island, uh, Shirley Arnold, who's the town historian. She's a cousin somehow. Um, she had copies of Alfred Knight's letters. I got Alfred Knight's uh, pension, uh, excuse me, service file from the National Archives, but it escaped me for years trying to figure out what this guy looked like. Um, I had a physical description from the uh, regimental descriptive books, uh, you know, uh, medium complexion, uh, hazel eyes, dark hair, but I didn't have an image of Alfred Knight. And this is where networking with geeks dealers uh, really, really paid off. A really good friend of mine, um, Chris Vandenbosch, he's an antiques dealer in Hopkinton, Rhode Island. Um, he's been collecting Civil War since, like me, since he was in college and uh, made a career out of uh, becoming an antiques dealer. And uh, Chris knew that Alfred Knight was my my great, great, great uncle. And one day he's at, in an antique store in Wickford, Rhode Island, and he finds a photo album that belonged to my great, great, great grandfather, Joseph Knight, who was Alfred's uh, youngest uh, brother. And Chris knew that I, this photo album I would want very much, so he bought it, sold it to me at cost, and he found something quite remarkable in my great, great, great grandfather's photo album. Two photographs of Alfred Sheldon Knight, the man who started it all. This is uh, pre-war, uh, probably I'm guessing about 1860 uh, image of him in uh, civilian clothes, uh, tintype. And this image, no back mark, written on the back, Alfred S. Knight, 
Company C, 7th RI, in uh, older handwriting. And this image, uh, best guess, was taken in, in Washington in September of 62 when the 7th uh, first got down uh, to Virginia. And I remember seeing uh, this, uh, Chris sent it to me in an email, and um, I think I had a cow that night. I, um, I was hyperventilating, uh, ecstatic, could not, um, could not put words in my mouth. But to actually have not only one, but two images of Alfred Sheldon Knight, to actually be able to put a face to the name, it was absolutely remarkable. I own a lot of things from the 7th Rhode Island. This right here is my absolute favorite, of course, being my uh, my relative. But also with that photo album, I got pictures of a lot of other uh, relatives. And uh, it was uh, quite remarkable. But again, to, uh, to have a photograph of my of my ancestor really does uh, really does mean a lot. Like I mentioned, uh, death followed the 7th Rhode Island everywhere they went. Uh, 243 men would die serving in the 7th Rhode Island, most of those to disease. One of those men was Private Henry H. Godfrey. Uh, Godfrey was a farm boy, 19 years old, from Hopkinton, Rhode Island. Uh, joined up with Company A, and he was one of many unfortunate men. He got sick, very sick, in Mississippi in the summer of 1863. And he was fortunate. He was discharged and sent back to Hopkinton, very sick. And he died 13 days after getting home in Hopkinton. <sighs> And that's Addison, uh, wondering what dad's doing. Um, so Godfrey gets back home, a sick man, lives for 13 days, and dies. And this image, uh, like several of them in the collection, I was very fortunate that while I was living in Rhode Island, I would, uh, I would travel the, the uh, auction circuit, uh, going to auctions all over the state and uh, nearby Connecticut. Um, just about every week there would be something uh, going on. And going to those auctions, I got to meet uh, fellow dealers, uh, fellow collectors, uh, you know, expressing my interest in the Civil War, primarily the 7th Rhode Island. And uh, this photograph of uh, Henry Godfrey, uh, taken by uh, N. Uh, Girardini uh, in Providence. Uh, this was taken... Uh, probably late August, uh, 62, while the 7th was training at Camp Bliss. But, um, you know, just really a remarkable uh, image, um, you know, of one of these men who uh, who didn't come back. But it's, you know, you see this guy, he's, you know, you know, almost has a really cocky look on his face. If, uh, you know, these men, um, you know, if these men knew what they were getting into, I, I doubt most of them would have volunteered, uh, knowing that, one in five would not have come back. I've um, got a question on there from uh, Robert uh, Lustria. Uh, Robert, uh, for a source for uh, archival uh, products, I recommend both uh, Gaylord and University products. That's where I buy uh, my stuff from that I use to preserve my collection. Um, University products and Gaylord, they're both really good. I, I can't say one is better than another. I usually just buy from whoever is on sale at the time. Um, another one, uh, Rod, um, Doug, uh, Segrillo saying Rod Coddington, um, uh, might help. But from my own personal experience, um, I go with, uh, university products or Gaylord because that's what we used when I worked as a national park ranger at, uh, Harper's Ferry. This one is a rather interesting a uh, photograph that actually came out of an auction in Foster, Rhode Island. 
Now, I should add most of what I have are CDVs. I, I have some tin types. Um, I'll get into that later. But this, this is rather interesting. This guy is Private Hiram Salisbury Batty of uh, Company K of the 7th. And looking at his picture, you can realize this guy was just a kid. He joined up at 16. He died when he was 17. He, uh, he was one of those many uh, 7th Rhode Island soldiers who got sick uh, down in Mississippi. And he made it to uh, Cincinnati. He made it to uh, Cincinnati. And uh, he died in Cincinnati of uh, dysentery. And he is uh, buried at uh, Spring Grove National Cemetery. Uh, in Cincinnati, one of uh, nearly 60 men from the 7th Rhode Island who died of illness during the Mississippi campaign. What makes this photograph interesting is, though, it's a period copy of an ambrotype. And somebody uh, went and took a copy of the image of Batty, uh, the ambrotype, and then printed uh, it on this uh, tintype. So it's a it's a rather rather interesting uh, memorial photograph, uh, more than likely uh, circulated among um, among family uh, members. Um, but you know, again, um, you know, really special because again, so many of these men, uh, one in five, died uh, in the service, and um, you know, this was probably printed for one of. Uh, Batty's uh, family members uh, to have as a memento to him because his remains never came home. They're uh, still buried out there at Spring Grove uh, National Cemetery. So uh, 17 years old uh, when he passed, it kind of gives you uh, kind of gives you goosebumps. <clears throat> as mentioned, the uh, you know, the Mississippi campaign was uh, really one of hardship for the men. Uh, this right here is part of the, uh, the reflection. I should add, I live in a, a house that was built in 1841. So the, uh, the lighting and the, uh, the windows aren't always the, uh, the best. So this right here is uh, Sergeant Jeremiah Penno Beasley of uh, Providence. He served in uh, Company B of the 7th. And uh, this photograph uh, was taken in Lexington, Kentucky in the fall of 1863. Uh, the 7th spent about four or five months in the city, uh, really recovering their strength after getting back from uh, Vicksburg. And, you know, looking at his, uh, try to get it closer to the camera, you know, really looking, you know, at his face, you really can see the weariness of that uh, campaign. Um, you know, they, the seventh endured so much down in Mississippi. Um, that's actually where they put their regimental monument. Um, Rhode Island contributed funds after the war for every regiment to put a monument somewhere. Uh, the veterans of the seventh debated putting it at Fredericksburg where they lost 197 men, finally settled at putting it in Vicksburg. Uh, one, they were the only Rhode Island unit there and also because they suffered so much. Uh, unfortunately, that monument was toppled by a tornado uh, last year. Uh, the National Park Service is still trying to raise funds to get it uh, put back up. Um, if you'd like to look into that, you can just Google uh, Seventh Rhode Island Tornado Vicksburg and see it. But um, I, I really like this photograph of Beasley because you can see the weariness of that campaign uh, on his face. Uh, he had a very fortunate uh, escape. Uh, June 8th, 1864, as the Army of the Potomac is still in the uh, entrenchments at Cold Harbor, Beasley shot in the head. And um, he survives. And uh, he actually lives until 1890. Uh, after the war, he becomes uh, very active with uh, George Brown Post of the, the uh, GAR, uh, moves to East Providence, works as a carpenter, and lives to 1890, but he suffered a severe head wound um, at Cold Harbor, um, but certainly uh, a really great image. And it is, um, it is partially, uh, partially tinted, um, you know, really great, really uh, crystal clear uh, image of uh, Sergeant Beasley. Let's go and have a uh, sip of water. <clears throat> 
Now the uh, the next two images have a uh, have a bit of a story to go with them that is uh, quite remarkable. <clears throat> As I mentioned, you know, for me, whether these men served in the Seventh Rhode Island, whether the photograph was taken before the war, after the war, during the war, as long as they served in the Seventh Rhode Island. That's what I'm looking for as both a collector and as a historian. Uh, several years ago, I made a really great purchase of a large grouping of letters written by this guy right here. Uh, this is Searles B. Young. Uh, Searles Young was uh, from Foster, Rhode Island, served in Company K of the 7th Rhode Island. Uh, Post-war image taken by H.G. Pierce of Providence, Rhode Island. Uh, Searles is rather interesting. He's one of the few college-educated men in the 7th Rhode Island. He had uh, gone to uh, New Hampton Theological Seminary in New Hampshire before the war. He was training to be a Baptist minister. The war started. Uh, the town he was living in, Foster, was offering $400 bounties. He was a radical abolitionist, believed very firmly in abolition, and he decided uh, to go. So I was fortunate to uh, get uh, the image of Searles uh, later on, but also of his wife, Anna Young, who he wrote those letters to. And what's remarkable is Searles kept all the letters Anna wrote to him. So I have their correspondence going back and forth. But one of, I think, the coolest items in the collection, and I'll, I'll digress for a second because this is quite interesting, is this. And I will, I will read just a short excerpt of Searle's memoirs. Um, I should add, uh, he had a remarkably long life. He lived until uh, 1925, despite what I'm about to read to you happened. The Battle of Fredericksburg began about noon on Saturday the 13th. We were marched out onto a plain in order to lie down in a place which was very much exposed to the enemy, fire. Soon we were ordered forward at the double quit. Two fences had been built across the plain and many of our men were killed while climbing over them. As I was lying on one elbow and tearing a cartridge to reload, a rifle ball from the enemy struck my index finger, cutting it nearly off. It broke my jawbone, cut my tongue almost in half, and passed out the side of my neck, very close to the jugular vein. As soon as there was a lull in the fighting, I began my way to the rear. I walked to the city and began a search for the hospital of the 7th. I was directed to the hospital of another regiment by mistake. When daylight came, I was obliged to start on my search again. I could not speak, but could only show an envelope which had on it my name and the number of my regiment. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the fragment of that envelope Searles Young is talking about in his memoirs. That is stained with the blood of his wound received at Fredericksburg. Uh, really, really, when you touch an item like this, it, it kind of brings the war home. Uh, almost 160 years later, um, this remarkable uh, item uh, that Searles Young used on the field of Fredericksburg to identify himself as a member of the 7th uh, Rhode Island. Get organized here. As I mentioned, the Seventh uh, suffered horribly at Fredericksburg. Uh, 197 casualties, 50 dead, 144 wounded, uh, three captured. It, 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 uh, the newspaper in South Kingston, Rhode Island, which that town lost 12 men that day. The newspaper couldn't even keep up with the bad news coming in. One of the men wounded at Fredericksburg was this guy right here, Caleb Mott. And uh, Mott was from my hometown of Warwick. And what makes this photograph uh, interesting is where it was taken. After the Battle of Fredericksburg, I hope you can uh, see that, 
Mott, like many members of the 7th, was sent to a hospital at Portsmouth Grove, Rhode Island, uh, located uh, about five or six miles north of uh, the city of Newport. And uh, that's where a lot of soldiers from not only Rhode Island, um, other New England states, uh, even some Confederates uh, were sent to uh, recover. But um, this is quite interesting because there was a photo photographic studio uh, at Portsmouth Grove, and a lot of soldiers had their photographs taken there. Uh, Mott was severely wounded in the leg, uh, never went back to the 7th, uh, and he didn't live too long after the war. He actually died uh, of pneumonia in 1871. Um, but quite an interesting uh, photograph. Uh, shout out to another friend of mine, Frank Gribb, uh, in 2012, wrote a really great book, uh, Rhode Island's uh, Civil War uh, Hospital, uh, which tells the story of uh, Portsmouth, uh, Portsmouth Grove. Really great book. So we all we all have uh, we all have uh, those stories, those uh, dead ends we've chased. We might have seen a photograph on. Uh, Civil War faces marketplace on eBay, uh, maybe at a, a relic show that, you know, we could kick ourselves we didn't get. This photograph went in circles around almost three times before it finally came home to uh, roost in Vermont. Uh, this right here is uh, Joseph, camera's over there, I'm using my wife's computer tonight. Uh, Joseph Morris was a drummer from Bristol, Rhode Island, uh, served in Company I, served uh, the whole two years and nine months of the 7th was, uh, was in existence. I first saw this photograph on eBay in 2006. It went for a, an amazing amount of money. I forgot what it was, but being a poor college student at the time who uh, was pretty much living on leftover pizza, I couldn't afford it. It popped back up on eBay in the summer of 2010 when I was a ranger at a Shenandoah National Park. I put in a pretty good sized bid. I lost the image again. Fast forward to the summer of 2018. I, uh, I discovered Civil War Faces Marketplace and I put a little, uh, just put a little thing, um, hey, new to the page, Rhode Island collector, um, if you've got anything, you know, I'd be interested in talking with you. A collector in San Diego had this picture. And uh, after missing it twice on eBay through Civil War Faces Marketplace, I was finally able to get it. Um, really, really happy that I finally got this. It's an amazing picture, uh, tinted. A really great image of Morris, but even more so, inscribed uh, on the back. Uh, this was photographed by, um, uh, Ron might know this guy, uh, G.W. Uh, Roseberry, uh, 95 King Street, Alexandria, uh, Virginia. And it was taken, uh, signed by Mott in July of 64. So uh, quite, quite a remarkable uh, image. And I'm so happy through Civil War Faces marketplace, I was finally able to get this. Now, ironically, about two months after this came home, uh, Civil War, I got a phone call from a Civil War dealer uh, down in Florida. And uh, this dealer happened to have Joseph Morris's personal copy of the history of the 7th Rhode Island, the canteen that he carried during the Overland campaign a bunch of uh, pension records, and a life-size painting of him. Um, that's put away. Um, I didn't want to bring it out, especially with little people uh, running around. But um, that, um, you know, that, that opened a floodgate of uh, Joseph Morris stuff. And fortunately, I was able to acquire that and um, was quite happy to bring uh, more of uh, Morris's uh, stuff into the uh, into the collection. Um, this one is this one's uh, interesting uh, for you know not so much who it is. It's a it's a typical standing photograph of a soldier. 
And this is uh, Joseph E. Seymour of Warren, Rhode Island. Uh, it was uh, photographed uh, in Warren uh, while uh, he was on furlough in February of 65. Um, but what makes uh, Seymour really interesting is his mother was a Wampanoag Indian. Uh, his mother uh, was Wampanoag. His father was white. Um, so he was uh, of mixed uh, ancestry. And it just goes to show you the, you know, the Civil War armies uh, that fought, especially for the North, they were such a, a blend of men from uh, different cultures, different uh, backgrounds. Um, there were several uh, Narragansett Indians uh, in the 7th Rhode Island from Company G, which was recruited uh, from South Kingston and Charleston, uh, Rhode Island. But, um, you know, Seymour being half Wampanoag um, just goes to show you, you know, what, what the regiment was composed of. Uh, uh, men are native-born uh, native uh, Rhode Islanders. Uh, there's a smattering of Irish, German, English, uh, Scottish immigrants, French Canadians, um, some uh, Native Americans, uh, such as Seymour, uh, in the regiment. Um, he had a very uneventful war. Um, he... Uh, fought in all the battles with the 7th Rhode Island, never wounded, uh, came home, and uh, was active uh, in the GAR. So uh, interesting, uh, interesting story uh, with him. Our next guy, uh, also from Bristol, did not have an, an unfortunate uh, ending. Um, you know, as, as I've reiterated, you know, post-war image, pre-war, Guy served in the 7th Rhode Island, and James Horde uh, was one of those men. Uh, Horde was severely wounded June 3rd, 1864, during the 7th Rhode Island's assault at Bethesda Church uh, near Cold Harbor. Uh, Shell came in, uh, took off his arm. But that did uh, not deter him. Uh, he returned to Bristol and became a police officer in 1866. Uh, he eventually became uh, chief of police in Bristol, serving uh, nearly 20 years as the uh, chief of police. He was very active in the, uh, the GAR, the Seventh Rhode Islands uh, Veterans Association, uh, and he lived until 1909. Um, this is a really nice uh, cabinet card um, that I found. Uh, I found at the Horse Soldier uh, in Gettysburg uh, years years ago. You know, over the years, I've, I've, I've seen these faces. I've literally memorized uh, the roster, all 1,145 men. I've got their names in most of these faces up here. So when I see one of these items, it's almost like, oh, yeah, that's James Ward. I, I knew that as soon as I walked into the horse soldier. The, uh, the most recent uh, image that I got um, about a month ago, uh, again, came right off of Civil War Faces Marketplace. And it was another one of those aha moments. Uh, Southern Historical uh, Antiques, I believe, um, the firm, it was great doing business with you, uh, Southern Historical uh, Antiques, posted this. Uh, unidentified Union Surgeon. I saw it and bingo, Dr. Albert G. Sprague, of the 7th uh, Rhode Island. And uh, Dr. Sprague was a medical uh, practitioner from my hometown of Warwick, Rhode Island. Joined up, served in the 7th. And what's interesting uh, with this picture, I have transcripts of uh, Sprague's uh, letters. The originals are at the uh, Chicago Historical Society out in Illinois. I still don't know how they got from Rhode Island to Illinois, but well, I'm still looking. Um, but he writes, to his wife to send a copy of the standing card to Colonel Bliss. This is the standing card. Uh, I'm sure uh, one of the copies, it's my mother-in-law, say hi. Um, but he actually wrote in a letter to his wife to send a copy of this photograph to Colonel Bliss. So quite remarkable. And uh, again, another one of those, you know, aha moments that, you know, I, I knew what this guy looked like, was able to put a uh, face to the name, uh, did a really great transaction, and the photo is now uh, in the collection. <clears throat> in 
if there was uh, if there was one man who, as a historian, I owe a lot to, it's this guy right here. Uh, this is William Palmer Hopkins. Palmer Hopkins of uh, West Greenwich, Rhode Island, served in Company D of the 7th Rhode Island, served a full two years and nine months. After the war, he moves to Lawrence, Massachusetts, and he devotes his life to the study of the regiment. He goes to battlefields. He writes thousands of letters to his comrades. Uh, he's secretary of the regimental association. And he really puts together uh, the history of the 7th. He wrote the regimental history that I spoke about earlier. Unfortunately, his papers, uh, he dies in 1920. Uh, his papers are scattered uh, to the winds. I've gotten um, some of them over the years. They've popped up at different auctions. Um, a good amount of them uh, came up in Keene, New Hampshire back in uh, 2012. Um, I live in northern Vermont, drove down to Keene. Uh, went to the auction, uh, got some of these items, and then drove back and had to go to work the next day. But this image is interesting because inscribed on the back is W.P. Hopkins with his compliments to his officer comrades of the 7th Rhode Island, Captain George N. Stone, Lawrence, Mass., December 12th, 1887. And so just really nice uh, post-war uh, cabinet card of a Rhode Island soldier, and especially, you know, happy to have this of Hopkins because he did so much to remember, you know, what his uh, regiment uh, did. But Hopkins had a very interesting thing of what he did. And what Hopkins did, he solicited almost 300 photographs from his comrades that he put into the book. But what he did, he would take the original uh, photograph, whether it was a CDV, an Ambrotype, and he would go to a, photograph, a studio in Lawrence, Mass., where he was living, and he would blow them up into cabinet cards. And I've found a number of these over the years. Uh, there's 300 of them floating around. I probably have uh, five or six. So if you know where the other 295 are, uh, please let me know. But he would uh, blow up the original, um, in this case, uh, this was a CDV, and uh, blow it up into a cabinet card, and then a uh, facial, um, you know, small, uh, almost gem-type uh, facial shot is what he put into the regimental history so we could put so many photographs in this. Uh, this guy is uh, Captain Theodore Wynn of Providence, Rhode Island. Uh, served in Company B of the 7th. Uh, he's wounded in the shoulder at Fredericksburg, returns to the regiment. On the morning of May 18th, 1864, he is the ranking uh, captain in the 7th. Uh, he had just led the 7th on May 12th. It's now May 18th. And that morning, the 7th was assigned another go at the Confederate entrenchments. Uh, when Wynn looks out at the Confederate entrenchments, realizes it's not going to be a good day for the regiment, literally resigns his commission on the field at Spotsylvania rather than lead his men into a desperate charge. Another officer, Percy Daniels, is the second uh, ranking captain. Daniels takes command of the regiment and pretty much almost destroys the 7th that day through a very reckless charge. Um... I wrote about it in one of my books, if you want the full story, but um, May 18th was not a good day for the 7th uh, Rhode Island. Uh, Wynn would move to uh, Washington after the war, and he's buried in Arlington. Excuse me. <clears throat> I should add that most of what I have is um, cabinet cards, CDVs, uh, some tin types. I've been collecting uh, Seventh Rhode Island images since 2005, and I really have not seen what we might call hard images, uh, Ambro types, other types of cased images of Seventh Rhode Island uh, soldiers. Um, I don't know where they are. If, if somebody knows where they are, uh, feel free to uh, 
to let me know. But the only cased image I have of Seventh uh, Rhode Island soldiers is uh, this really uh, interesting photograph of uh, three Seventh uh, Rhode Island officers that was taken in Lexington, Kentucky in the fall of 1863. And this came to me uh, through the horse soldier, uh, together with a lot of other papers of Captain Peleg Peckham, who is the uh, officer uh, right here, uh, wearing his sash as uh, officer of the guard or officer of the day, uh, together with uh, two of his colleagues. Uh, Peckham is an absolutely remarkable soldier. I, I could have an hour to just talk about this guy. Um, he goes from absolutely hating Abraham Lincoln uh, after Fredericksburg with the issuance of the Emancipation Proclamation to writing impassioned letters to the Providence Journal in the fall of 1864, basically saying, re-elect Lincoln. We've been out here for years fighting this war. The only way to end it is to elect Lincoln. Uh, unfortunately, Peckham will not see the end of the war. He is killed in action at Petersburg, Virginia, April 2nd, uh, 1865. Uh, in the middle there is George Wilbur. Uh, Wilbur uh, another fascinating individual. Uh, he's a lawyer before the war, uh, severely wounded at Fredericksburg, uh, rises uh, to command uh, Company K of the 7th. After the war, he becomes a judge, eventually becoming an associate justice of the Rhode Island Supreme Court. A really remarkable individual, really well-respected uh, lawyer and uh, judge. Uh, the officer on the uh, the far side, that's uh, Captain Percy Daniels. He was who led that uh, very reckless charge at uh, Spotsylvania. Uh, Another long story, he's absolutely hated uh, by uh, the men of the 7th Rhode Island. Um, he becomes lieutenant colonel uh, commanding the regiment. Um, I should have added Bliss commands a brigade for the rest of the war. He's really only in command of the regiment at Fredericksburg in the Mississippi campaign. He becomes a, he never receives a brigadier star, but he becomes a brigade commander um, from 63 uh, onward. So Daniels is uh, placed in command of the 7th Rhode Island, a uh, very reckless uh, officer, um, a stickler for discipline, um, you know, polishing your shoes after a long mud march, uh, very much hated by the men. After the war, he moves out to uh, Kansas and uh, ironically becomes Lieutenant Governor of uh, Kansas and he's buried out in uh, Girard, uh, Kansas. But um, this is the only, uh, you know, quote unquote, hard or uh, cased image uh, that I have of the Seventh Rhode Island. And I will end uh, it with uh, one of my one of my favorites that really shows the uh, the bonds of brotherhood. You know, these men, you know, served together from September of 1862 uh, through June 9th of 1865 along the way. They are at Fredericksburg, Vicksburg, Jackson, the Wilderness, Spotsylvania, North Anna River, Cold Harbor, Petersburg, the Weldon Railroad, Hatcher's Run, Pop Spring Church, and other, and uh, Fort Hell uh, before Petersburg. You know, we've often, if you've read, uh, if you've read some of the earlier accounts of uh, Civil War veterans, there there was this hypothesis that there was uh, this hibernation period that Civil War veterans in the 1860s, 1870s wanted to just brush the war aside and forget about it. The men of the Seventh didn't do that. They formed a Veterans Association early on in 1873, and they met. Uh, right through 1921. Uh, they would hold a reunion in August uh, somewhere in, in Rhode Island. Uh, they would also meet on December 13th uh, for the anniversary of Fredericksburg. And most of these men who had been recruited in the same communities, they joined the GAR post together, uh, the veterans associations, but the bonds of brotherhood were so strong and it continued throughout their lives. And that's what I wanted to end with, with this, uh, one of my, one of my favorite uh, photographs, again, pardon the, uh, pardon the glare. 
Um, this photograph was taken in October of 1903. Uh, in October of 1903, Rhode Island opened a new state house. It's the state house um, that you see if you're driving on Route 95 and uh, through Providence today. And as part of that ceremony, of the opening of the state house. The old battle flags of Rhode Island were brought from the old state house on Benefit Street uh, to the new state house. And uh, it was really the last big gathering of Rhode Island Civil War veterans. Hundreds of veterans paraded, and um, among them were almost uh, 75 veterans of the 7th Rhode Island. I should add the last veteran of the 7th died uh, April 22nd, 1939. <laughs> Uh, that was Elijah Watson of uh, Coventry. That's Addison saying hello. Um, but this photograph, you know, really shows bonds of uh, brotherhood. Um, these are three, these are, excuse me, four veterans of Company F of the 7th. Uh, we have uh, Nathan B. Lewis. Uh, he became another judge in Rhode Island. Uh, Mander Maynard, uh, Varnum Dawley, and... Isaac uh, Darling. So uh, four veterans of Company F. Um, Company F was hit very hard at uh, Cold Harbor. Uh, Lewis actually found himself in command of uh, the company that day. Um, I had it out. This is uh, a really nice uh, post-war uh, cabinet card um, that uh, Lewis had uh, made, excuse me, Hopkins had made. You can see uh, W.P. Uh, Hopkins, uh, his uh, tag on the uh, on the back. Uh, this actually, uh, this photograph actually has a, a funny uh, story. If you know the uh, country singer Billy Gilman, uh, country singer from uh, Rhode Island, um, back about ten years ago, uh, Billy needed some money, and so he was a great 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 grandson of Nathan Lewis. And uh, Billy sold all of Nathan Lewis's uh, photographs, letters, etc., to an antique dealer in Rhode Island. And uh, needless to say, they eventually found their way into my collection. Um, so thank you, uh, Billy Gilman, for uh, the photograph of uh, Nathan B. Lewis. But um, again, um, you know, really great, Im really great post-war image that really shows you know, the bonds of uh, brotherhood um, that these men shared uh, throughout their lives. So I've gone a little bit over. I, I literally could be here uh, all night talking about the 7th Rhode Island. It's something that I, I very much, uh, very much love uh, speaking about, love uh, sharing my collection. And um, I'll just end with uh, two, uh, two points that, um, you know, I, I've got a list of uh, Questions here. Future plans for the collection. That is a very tough one. Um, you know, like most, like most of my fellow collectors, when I uh, when I began this collection, I was uh, I was in college. I was single. Well, uh, over the years, um, I met a, a very lovely lady uh, who's in the other room named Elizabeth. Uh, ironically, uh, Elizabeth uh, grew up in the same town as me in Rhode Island, uh, didn't know each other, and we met up here in Vermont. Well, Elizabeth and I got married uh, three years ago. We have a wonderful daughter, Addison, who you probably have in the background, and we have a uh, soon-to-be-born daughter, uh, Mackenzie, who is due to be here on uh, May 25th. So, you know, I really can't uh, predict the future of the uh, collection. I'm certainly holding on to what I have. It's not going anywhere. Um, you know, new additions as I see things, as things pop up. You're fortunate through uh, Marketplace to uh, get some really good images. Um, you know, the Civil War market, uh, especially for a small state, Rhode Island, um, these things are very pricey. So, you know, I'm sure I'm not done uh, collecting but, um, you know, with a wife, two kids, you know, I certainly don't know, uh, don't know where the uh, collection will go. Um, just don't tell my wife that uh, I'm always on the lookout. Advice I would give to uh, young folks who are getting into this, getting their feet wet. I would, the, the advice I would give you is be specific with your collecting. You know, like me, I had a relative who was in a regiment that nobody collected. You know, if you go out there and collect some of the, the famous units, such as the Iron Brigade, the Irish Brigade, um, Confederate images are, are certainly 
uh, more expensive. But I would I would highly suggest to young collectors getting into it, especially if you have, if you're like me, if you have a relative in a specific unit and it leads you to study, um, if it leads you to study um, unit uh, specifically, um, you know, take your time, uh, find, talk to fellow collectors, go on a place like uh, Civil War Faces, link up with fellow collectors. Don't be afraid to ask questions. You know, do you think this image is worth it? Do you think that this image is worth the price I might be paying? Um, you know, certainly in my early days of collecting, I had to let a lot of images go that I might otherwise want. Um, like that image of uh, Joseph's, um, excuse me, uh, the tinted image, uh, it eventually found its way into my collection, uh, Joseph Morris. So be patient, be persistent. Uh, things are out there. Um, don't, you know, certainly live your life. Don't spend all your money on Civil War things. Um, you know, I remember one day in college, um, it was the choice between buying a CDV on eBay or having lunch that week. Needless to say, I... Uh, I bought the uh, I bought the CDV and I uh, I pretty much I think starved to death eating ramen noodles or some other stuff that week. So you know save your money, buy images that that are interesting to you that are um, are are help you to build your collection. This collection wasn't built overnight. This collection has been built going on 15 years. Um, so you're not going to get a, a collection like this overnight. So certainly, you know, take time, link up with fellow collectors, link up with historians, um, network like, like I did. You know, if you live in a place where you can go to antique shops or contact dealers, uh, link up with them. You know, they've been in the field for a number of years. You know, they're really great uh, resources. They'll help you to build your collection. Uh, certainly subscribe to Military Images. I've been subscribing for a while. I save every issue. I absolutely love military images. It's a great, great uh, resource. Uh, even more importantly, though, uh, Civil War Faces, other um, another group that I'm uh, that I'm a very large contributing member to is Rhode Island Military History because of the Rhode Island collection. But I assume other states, other areas. Um, I know Pittsburgh. Uh, Civil War is a really good group if you live in Western uh, Pennsylvania. So there certainly are resources out there. And no matter who you contact, we want to help uh, young people get started, get into this, and enjoy the hobby of collecting. You know, I'm a caretaker of this collection. I don't know what's going to happen to it one day. Uh, but, you know, right now, I'm the caretaker of the Seventh Rhode Island. Um, certainly have enjoyed uh, speaking uh, with you uh, tonight. If uh, anybody has uh, any questions, uh, look me up on Facebook. Uh, send me a message, Rob Grandchamp. Uh, happy to assist and uh, answer any questions. And uh, I'm a frequent poster on uh, Civil War Faces uh, for my Rhode Island collection. Uh, thank you so much and uh, have a great night. Stay safe out there and uh, we'll all get through this together. Have a good one. Night.